This is Brian. I'm going to review Musashi's Dogodo, The Way of Walking Alone. Half crazy, half genius, finding modern meaning in the sword saint's last words. Originally by Miyamoto Musashi. The authors are Lawrence Kane, Chris Wilder, Elaine Barres, Lisa Christensen, and Wallace Smedley. From Japanese, it can be translated into The Way of Walking Alone, The Way of Following Alone, The Path of Aloneness, The Way to Go Forth Alone, or The Way of Walking Alone. He wrote these 21 precepts before he died, and he gave it to his student, Tarao Maganojo. And make sure you read his other book, The Book of Five Rings. I read this last year. I consider it the best work that I read last year. It is cited many times in Robert Greene's book. That's how I found out about him through his books, 33 Strategies of War and 48 Laws of Power. And the Book of Five Rings is more of like a book of strategy. It is good for martial artists, business people, and gamers. A short bio on Musashi before we carry on is that he was one of the greatest swordsmen to ever live. It's arguably be known. He had family problems, was kicked out, and survived on his own. That is why it's called The Way of Walking Alone. He was an unconventional thinker, a different type of fighter. He fought with two swords as a samurai. He also beat someone up with a paddle or a piece of wood. I have to look back and confirm this because there's always stories and it's hard to believe what you hear. There is a novel that I have not read yet. It's Musashi, an epic novel of the samurai era by Aiji Yoshikawa. And this is one of the reasons why Musashi has such a huge mystique to him. And there's mysteries of surrounding his life. How did this great fighter come to be? What happened? He is one of the most interesting masters to ever live. I would love to meet this person and, and see how he fought and someone you could learn under. He also was a Buddhist and spent time in the jungle out in some cave. He defeated about 60 samurais, was an exceptional poet, as you can see through these books, a calligrapher, and an artist. This is something you have to see with the grace of the sword is you have the grace with the pen as well. In a modern day era, you don't see this type of grace you see with the hand. It's Everything's typing now. Speed is king. The type of Eastern philosophy that you see, it's more of a slowness and connection. It's the present moment, being in the zone. Like you can find this information through Eckhart Tolle, and that's how it's spreading through the West. Is You have a white guy writing a book about Eastern philosophy, and that's how it's somewhat being spread. And in times like this where masculinity is becoming a big issue, and I did a other review on Modern Romance by Aziz Ansari. And now you see the dichotomy of a herbivore, a grass-eating herbivore, and then you see the samurai. And they're, they're, they were the land of the samurai, Japan. And Japanese culture is one of those most interesting places that I want to go visit. I used to play a lot of video games with Samurai Showdown, Dragon Ball Z, all things Japan, sushi, sashimi. And I had a Honda Civic SI, now I have a Subaru, so I'm really a big fan of Japanese culture. And of course, being a ninja warrior. The book is written in a format of five interesting perspectives. There is the monk, Chris Welder, the warrior, Elaine Baresi, the teacher, Wallace Smedley, the insurance agent, Lisa Christensen, the businessman, Lawrence Kane. It is written well compact with simple paragraphs. Sometimes the subjects only wrote like one or two pages, or if they had expertise in a certain precept, they would write more. They have a female and an insurance agent, Lisa Christensen, and most of these people do martial arts, but it is, it is good to have an interesting perspective from a female, especially when it's the way of walking alone. You get, you get to see a female perspective and adds a little Cajun spice to the stew. One thing that struck me about the book in the first part of the book is that they target him as a functional psychopath because he had such fearlessness and ruthlessness to him, that he had such mastery of the sword and mastery of the way that he would go on a killing spree almost. But it wasn't like a killing spree. These were duels, like Wild West Slingers, or they cite tons of works that make this a really good book to read. I'm going to go over all 21 precepts. The first precept is accept everything just the way it is. Simply, this is to accept the objective truth. Plain and simple, no fluff, no sugar coating. What is it that you really see? The warrior says, be a realist. It is vital to see the world as it truly is in order to keep yourself safe. Be conscious of the nature and the environment around you. Let it stream into your consciousness. 
Accept it. Don't use avoidance or denial. Don't block it, even though the truth may be hard to swallow. For the teacher, I like this. He put the confirmation bias. What that is, is it is the act of mentally taking note of and remembering only those bits of information that confirm our pre preconceived notions. And what that means is sometimes people ask, we'll try to get a second opinion of what something is. And if they say yes, they were just looking for a confirmation. And sometimes that can be blinding because you're just looking for approval when you really should be looking at what it really is. And to not take things as face value, things are deeper than that. There is a reality and a fantasy. The insurance executive talks about the media and especially now the media tries to do control your mind. It's like the thought police and they, they're working with the government to sell you a image with a story using amygdala hijacking and really manipulating you. Make sure you travel around and see things with, for what they are. Go to the country and you'll see what's actually going on. The media has an agenda and that's profit. Step number two, do not seek pleasure for its own sake. For the monk, you can see this in Eastern cultures as you see the, the Buddhism that they have a controlled desire. To control desire is the task. In terms of hedonism, you're going to need more and more. It could be sex, drugs, rock and roll. If you live that lifestyle, it's going to bite back. There's not just pleasure and safety. It is best to simplify and remove yourself from that environment. And freedom relies on that. You don't have to depend on this desire. It could be a drug. For the warrior, it's pain and pleasure are linked. If you live the high life and enjoying after winning your battles, you're enjoying sake all the time. You're enjoying the fruits of your labor. And if you enjoy the fruits for too long, there's only one way to go, and that's down. And you may decrease your desire to, to do better in your life by overindulging on a shallow lifestyle. For the teacher, your senses can get dull with the old indulgence. It's, it's probably better to spread out the pleasure, make use of hard work. There, has to be, there is some sacrifice and fulfillment in the delayment of gratification. For the insurance executive, she says, happiness is found where you are right now, in quotes. And if you indulge in all these pleasures, you may look back and always look at that time of how, how you had it so high. You were so high on the kite. This can happen to people in high school where they reach their peak and never really get anywhere after high school. Kind of like the quarterback in high school or the popular kids, also the cheerleaders. For the businessman, these desires can create like an instant gratification. If you want it now, there could be stealing within the company, corruption going on to get what you want, politics, and stealing to take advantage of the company where it's supposed to be a reciprocal relationship where everybody wins, the business and the customers and yourself wins. There just needs to be a good balance between work and play. Reset number three, do not under any circumstance depend on a partial feeling. I consider this don't trust your intuition or your gut. Most people say to trust your gut. I think there's a little bit of patience and clarity that needs to be found. You have to let the mud settle. For the monk, I do like the example the monk used. It was for the Fifth Amendment, and that is something that protects rights for yourself or self-indictment. And just because you're not saying anything doesn't mean you're guilty. And if you ever deal with the cops or the FBI or any type of bureaucrat, it's their mode of communicating with you that you're guilty, that you're lying and have something to hide. And as humans being social animals, they may believe someone through with authority and use a bias against you what they say is true when it is in fact not. In other words, rely on wisdom and action. For the warrior, in quotes, trust but verify. And when your information is finally correct, you can finally take action. You have to be aware of your surroundings as a samurai that Musashi was and any martial artist. You have to be aware of your body, the environment, and have a keen awareness of the nature of the situation. For the teacher, knowledge is power. And here's a good quote, every action having an equal and opposite re reaction and a social media overreaction. So much of the awareness that you can see in the Eastern philosophy is a true awareness. And social media is becoming a good tool, but it's also becoming an instant, instant information to jump to conclusions. And it's causing overreactions. And right now you have, it's being cited as call, being called the outrage culture. People that watch too much TV, too much social media are having their lizard brains being fried. 
Tants go out, go walk alone on the beach, and go have look people in the face and communicate with real people. For the insurance executive, there's she puts a a metaphor as in Vegas. Vegas giving you that feeling with the slot machines, the one armed bandit. You always have this feeling that you're gonna win, but you never really do. It's the odds are against you. That's how they make their money. Zombies tend to live on the slot machines. It's good to go party. There's great places out in uh, the Red Rock Canyon. I go rock climbing in. It's better to go out in nature and figure it out there yourself and chill out, have fun. And she uses almost the opposite of what I said about the FBI and police. They always have to trust and verify that, you know, you assume that they're lying and then you check it again, then everything else is a lie. There will always be this fuzziness and discrepancies that you have to look out for. And in terms of the businessman, it's pretty much all or nothing in business. You have to make it work. You can't do halfway. Once the action is taken, the action is taken. You can pivot to make it work out. You have to make a decision. Reset number four, think lightly of yourself and deeply of the world. For the monk, it's simply the ego and the ego stroke. Are you going to let in the truth and let other opinions or data into your mind? It may not be true, but just to reconsider the notion. For the warrior, he puts it as a social service, like a duty to act, to physically act and defeat your enemy. This is one thing that you see that I don't agree with the warrior in this sense. It could be a peaceful warrior, like, say, the monk. In terms of warrior, say, you're in the military, you, you might have to do things for duty. You don't have a choice. Your job is to take the order and to win the war. And what you could do is, is a stark contrast between the virtue of selfishness, not just selfishness, being selfish, unabashedly selfish. And you can learn more about that through Atlas Shrugged and the virtue of selfishness, which is in the title by Ayn Rand. And there is no honor in being a disposable male for war. And he also inputs the selfish materialism that he sees around him, that it's not just not about you. A simple reward of sharing a good time is great. For the teacher, he put it, taking things lightly. Don't take things so seriously. If your mind and emotions turn against you, just relax and chill. For the insurance executive, she uses individualism versus the Japanese group-oriented style and contrasts it that. And even though I live the way of rugged individualism, it is important to know that people are around you, that there is a connection that you can have, you should have with people, not just throw your shit all over the place. And in America, you see these people with luxury items, they just care about themselves. She has the guts to say the selfie culture where it's a self-centered trend i don't i do the selfies but i don't really go overboard like you see on instagram she puts the selfies as people taking selfies in front of burn homes traffic accidents i'm not sure about the in front of open coffins and funeral homes i don't know if that's all that bad i would want to see take a picture of my late grandma or grandpa i would like to have that so i don't see that as bad but i do see some selfies out in national parks where they they took a selfie with a buffalo, and the person winded up dying. This is not the only time it's happened. That you don't turn your back on nature like that. And she's calling out on the duck face, which is a meme. It's everywhere. It's funny, but um, I still like to see the selfies. But it's important to understand that other people around you. I think that's what's great about traveling. In terms of Japan, I really want to go to this place. I have to travel there. Not just to see the robots and the herbivores, but to check out the nature and the Buddhism culture out there. It's very neat and clean there. That's what I've heard. For the businessman, he pretty much sums it up as conscious capitalism. Just to be conscious of your surroundings. Not just be there for profit. Precept number five, be detached from desire your whole life. And I like this quote they have in the beginning. Man is the only animal whose desires increase as they are fed. The only animal that is never satisfying. Henry George. Precept is hard to understand by desire your whole life. Because you do want to desire things. And there is this balance, harmony of you want to take action. There's desire. You should try for things. Desire things. Not just be entitled or to go overboard. There is that fine point of what's enough. But desire is completely good to have and normal. And that's where Eastern philosophy tends to struggle, yet is the highlight. And in modern 
Western culture, it is good to understand the whole, the overindulgence of materials. And in terms of the pursuit of happiness, what is the pursuit? What is the pursuit of happiness in terms of Thomas Jefferson? He wants to pursue that route. And for the monk, he uses desire as in terms of the social. And humans and animals are social animals. But Musashi was special in that, if you, you know, the title, Way of Walking Alone. He was a true loner, a true master of what he did. And he's citing, he's citing songs, for example, I Walk Alone type of mentality you see with teenagers. There is Lone Wolf's. This Lone Ranger style really is being a man. Is you don't have the crutches around you. You can do everything yourself. That I can do spirit. It's really the effort that counts. And even though they are symbols of fake characters, I do think it's a better ideal of a man than, say, a zombie hipster. And some other icons that he mentions are a loner. Like you see, the lone wolf in the media is very stigmatized and has a negative connotation like seducers and hustlers but it's really a a virtue the wild west gunslinger or the masterless ronin which musashi is he's a ronin for the warrior it's fear and wanting and wishing for things to happen it's easier said than done but you have to have the mind to control your emotions for the teacher he's saying desire is a good thing to have it's okay to have that this way you can accomplish something you need that drive and that drive and desire combined together can help you accomplish good things sometimes there are instances where you are a gifted person or you have talent or you're highly intelligent nothing can really happen unless you take action and you have the drive those are the people that actually execute in life for the insurance executive desire is to be controlled, not to be taking over your life. You can desire everything and you can't have everything. You can't have it all. And she makes a good point that if you pursue all these desires, you're gonna lose integrity and honesty. And fear can make you desire something even more. It's the equivalent of a one day sale only or an hour special. And you may be spending up time that you could be used more effectively than pursuing aimless pursuits and in terms of the businessman if there's no desire there's no drive especially in the capitalistic culture of the united states you're not going to accomplish much by not doing anything and with the for-profit and competition model that they have the desire to sell or to be great is enhanced and it creates a free market a competitive atmosphere and competition is good Precept number six, do not regret what you have done. It is straightforward in the sense that just don't have regrets. I didn't really think about this till I was maybe 23, but one of my mentors told me he doesn't apologize. He doesn't believe in apologizing. And it took me a while to understand that, but he explained more to me. And in terms of these emotions that they can lead to, is that some of these emotions can lead to guilt or shame. Those are two things you want to avoid. You don't want to be a part of those. That culture can put you down or to live in these rules. People may enforce a guilt in you or shame you. I mean, all life is an experiment. You took an action and there's no reason to look back and be ashamed. Mistakes happen. For the monk, he says to not live in the past, but you can visit it. And here is the best quote, I think, in the book. It says... He had no ties of social responsibility from any domain, secular or religious. There was nothing to regret, let alone any emotion of regret to work through. And that really explains what type of warrior that Musashi was. He wasn't attached to anything. He was a rebel. He was an outsider living on his own, living by his own terms. He was full of creativity and an experimenter. And this does conflict with apologies and forgiveness. This is where... It's hard to understand what you want to do. It's okay to be forgive or to apologize. But like I said before, it's, he didn't believe in apologizing. I really thought about that. To me, it means to not be weak. Learn to not cry about things that are outside of your control. Be present. And to really trust your intellect and to avoid being emotionally downward and backward. And for the warrior... I like what he points out as in 
not using impracticality and the useless of the feeling of regret that was written in the book. That it can be time consuming while you wallow and look back at your life and you just look at regrets. You look at what you've done. It's just good to learn from it. Don't let it bring you down. And for the teacher, he looks at back his life and, you know, if you had that do over, if you could just do that over again, your life would be better. There's no way to go back in time. You're stuck in the past. Always the present moment. That's what's something that all the Eastern philosophy is, is the present moment. And when you're in the zone as Musashi, where it's life and death to win, to kill or be killed, the present moment is nothing like this type of world that he's in. The dwelling can bring you down and into this negative spiral. And all that is is a waste of time. You have to move forward and learn from it. And these negative emotions are contagious. For the businessman, it's really just analyzing his business that your regrets, you can't look at the past in terms of your regrets. Business is always changing. It's dynamic. You can't look at the mistakes that you've made. you got to move forward. Technology changes fast and you can end up like Blockbuster and be conquered by Netflix. If you don't adapt with the times and understand your customer, then you're not going to keep up with business. In terms of business, they want to hire slow and fire fast. When you fire people, you know, you want to forget about it. And what happened with Ellen Powell, the CEO of Reddit, she fired someone very important. It came back to haunt her and she lost her job. She's not one of the favorite social justice warriors that I've encountered. And if you lie, that the cover-up, the, the web of lies can be worse than the crime itself. If there's someone that did something really bad and costs a company and there's covered with lies just to save your ass, that will come back to haunt you as well. That can cause regrets. Not so much a mistake, but it's all the lies that happen. Precept number seven, never be jealous. For the monk, it's simply never engage in jealousy. Save your time. And in terms of the way, I like the way the monk puts it, is that it is a distortion and a lie. And in quotes, jealousy is destructive and like a virus either maims or kills its host. For the warrior, in quotes, jealousy indicates insecurity and insecurity will lessen the competency and effectiveness of a warrior. Another quote by Theodore Roosevelt, comparison is the thief of joy. And in terms of research to learn from other people, when you're researching other people and seeing, you know, how much skill they have, how much mastery they have, how much time and effort they put into it, you cannot discount them to make yourself feel better about yourself and be caught up in the moment of you wanting what they have or your perception of what they have. Work on yourself and improve your confidence and everything will work out. For jealousy, for the teacher, people will murder over jealousy of an affair. This is a deep-rooted insecurity that happens between people. And one thing I want to point out is that in terms of jealousy, a guy being jealous of another guy getting the girl, that is more of an insecurity. If a girl, if a few girls are jealous of a woman getting the guy, that is more of a status. Females in general are inherently insecure. It's due to the independence. There is an independence for a woman, but deep root insecurity as such as women sabotaging each other, bad mouthing other women, calling them whores or easy. That is something that the type of jealousy that is unacceptable. For the insurance executive, she puts it as if she only had beauty, you can really pick at your own insecurities. You're not going to be the perfect supermodel look and body. You have to be secure with yourself. There's so much makeup, especially in the West and in, in America and England, that they sell products to Take advantage of that youth, and, and especially for women, they have that fertility window from, say, 18 to 30 years old, and they have to make prime use of that period. And with the makeup and all the contraptions that she uses to disguise it, she wants to give herself as high value as possible, even if she's older than that age. So women should never be jealous of a female in her prime. It's Fertility is not to be worshipped, but to be celebrated when a, a female hits... I believe in her prime is 21 years old where she's glowing and she's at her peak fertility. That is when you want to start having your mating opportunities to get your, the best genes you can get because that window does close. In quotes, social status, wealth, looks, or skill of some desired trait is admitting the other's superiority. Be content with yourself. Never be jealous. And for the businessman, 
Jealousy can be, you know, of course it's insecurity, but it can be envy in terms of envy of business or envy a mentor as well. Or if you're a mentor and you raise up a student or an apprentice and they're better than you, you cannot be jealous of them. And he makes a point out to create win-win relationships. This could be all around the board. In the circle of business, you don't want to losers. Precept number eight, never let yourself be saddened by a separation. This is what put this is what Masashi made him different. He could walk away through anything. Family, friends, he was a loner. And it's hard to do that when you're a social animal. You have these emotions, connections. There's always that physical affection, whether it be male or female, just a hug. It brings a smile to you. It causes a chemical reaction. It's normal to be around people. But it is also important for a man to be able to stand up on his own two feet. For the monk, he's making it a point to be comfortable with yourself. At some point, you have to be out on your own. And this is a somewhat of a rite of passage for man is to leave the womb. You leave your home, house home and you're out exploring to be an, an independent individual. Or it is the effort just to try. And then you, if that doesn't happen, you try again. For the warrior, it's, it is to have no deep relationships. And this can be hard. His type of style was a loner style. You trained with whoever you had to and killed who you had it kill to get better but if you live this shallow lifestyle it's going to affect you right i mean it can cause mental neurosis he must have used all his sexual transmuted energy to master whatever he wanted for the teacher he talks about this is an important aspect too is the separation of loss or anxiety and i notice this with a lot of people nowadays they have anxiety issues where they're afraid to be alone they can't take care of themselves they need their cell phone you know you can't live without your cell phone it's that's very bizarre. This is just something that's happened in the past 10 or 15 years. There's a lot of anxiety issues where they freak out. They've never been outdoors. They just live in a city. So people don't have a natural connectedness with the nature, nature of yourself or the real nature, not just billboards, cement, and honking. For the insurance executive, she is a female, so she doesn't really believe in this concept. And it, it is hard for a female to not be saddened by the connection. It, for females, it's just natural for them to socially connect. They talk more. They gossip more. They tend to be more affectionate. It depends. She, she could be a cold refrigerator. You never know. See, if a woman goes her own way like this, she kind of turns up to into being a crazy cat lady. That is something I don't think anyone wants to see. For a man, I do think you should go out and be on your own, but it's great to be around family and friends and everybody else is kind of a small supporter in your world. From the businessman, it's more complicated. He makes it seem like you should never really be paralyzed by it, that you're going to see people come and go in your business as well as to keep professional and personal relationships differently. This will be a big issue coming in the years with being politically correct, being in a very insane time in our life where there's cameras, there's digital documents, and you could be fired for anything you say. I think that will change in the future, but it is something to be aware of, especially if you have, you're working for a big corporate business or working with the public and have an HR, human resource department, where they can enforce rules on you and do it without you even. They could fire you without even really telling you the truth. And this is causing a ton of drama in big companies. That's why many people are going entrepreneurial route in small business so that the freedom is just so much better. And if you do this walk alone or do small group things, it's so much more freer than I've experienced because I was working a corporate job and now I do more small time work and it's so much more free and you're, you're more alive. Reset number nine, resentment and complaint are appropriate neither for oneself nor others. For the monk, this is... An awareness. You see, this uh, this Buddhism culture, it's an awareness, a contentment. What he puts it as is, here's a quote, nevertheless, gaining or attempting to gain power by thinking of yourself as a victim is a profound act of hubris. And understand there's no virtue in victimhood. Resentment and complaint are easy. Resentment, complaints, entitlement, blaming, projecting, and victimhood are very easy to do. Just words. It can be created by words. For someone to gain by victimhood, it is against it is against the universe. And this type of process that occurs is these negative emotions validate the lower consciousness. Buddhism and all this meditation is more about reaching an enlightenment, a higher state of consciousness. And what you're not aware of is 
is that you're content or you are able to do something. You are a survivor. You're not a victim. This is very important to understand with the social justice warrior crowd getting popularity. The resolution is to forgive and accept. The teacher says resentment and complaint are pretty useless in quotes. I don't necessarily agree with the complaints are pretty are all useless, but complaining is okay, but there is that excessive complaining where you complain about everything in your environment where you feel like you it's lacking. The moment is lacking something. The moment is missing something to make it complete where you have to accept the reality for what it is and don't get caught up in an illusion. You have to grind it out and hustle. For the insurance executive, she talks about resentment and how it can cause low self-esteem. In terms of relationships, sometimes these resentments can build where it becomes. The arrangement is where both of the participants are lowering each other's self-esteem. Just understand life's not that miserable. The businessman's got to correct in terms of, in quotes, do not abide chronic complainers, people who incessantly whine, nitpick, and criticize others. Those are the type of things you want to avoid and the people you want to avoid being around. He brings in a Disney character, Eeyore. He's that donkey that's always down. And he makes it a point to stamp out that type of negativity because it's, it's because it is contagious and infectious. And if it's happening all the time, it can cause a spiral. And this is not to say that you shouldn't look at things in a positive or negative point of view. It's just being the pessimistic Peggy or Debbie Downer you want to avoid. The in control, you could do it mentality. As I said before, complaining is easy and anything too easy has no value. Precept number 10, do not let yourself be guided by the feelings of lust or love. This is a more f harsh precept because, you know, he was more of a loner. Lust is understandable. This is like the seven deadly sins of lust being one of them. But love is something you want to do. It's, it's it's life. It's life and it gives life. And the monk says that love is a very important thing. It is that human connection, not just connection with humans, but nature, animals, and the universe is a fundamental right. And despite being passive, love is an action and a choice. For the warrior, uh, this is something I learned. I didn't know this, is that in terms of lust, adultery is a crime in the military. I did not I'm not sure about that, so I'll do more research on that. But in terms of the military, especially the United States military, there is there is a duty to be had. And in quotes, military by eroding, morale, good order, discipline, respect for authority, unit cohesion, or by compromising the military mission itself. This is something that I think I don't think the military ha really has no right. They don't belong in people's relationships or in marriage. I don't believe in the big government. They tend to make things up for their own gain. But I will do more research on the proclaimed adultery. And in terms of the teacher, he puts it as a selfishness. And in terms of love, I think you can love many people. I don't have this soulmate theory that people have. I think, especially if you're a man, you could have many wives. If you're a woman, you only have a few chances. In terms of the female, she has to get the top male that can for genetics and as well as for resources to perpetuate a high quality sapien, thus receiving a high quality offspring. Hypergamy is natural, is normal. For the insurance executive, she mentions Bill Clinton's and Bill Cosby's. This is just recent stuff on, I don't really have any comment on that. I don't know what's, she does point out a fact on beauty and how lust, this tends to control men, especially in terms of porn and just the physical attributes of a female, like um, the hips, the fertility signals that a, a female conveys, is that she's not just, she's not an object of your affection. She's a real person. And to not take things as face value because she can be beauty, beautiful, but she could also be ugly and awful person. Look behind the makeup. For the businessman, of course, this is going to affect the workplace environment and there's anti-discrimination laws, there's sexual harassment, favoritism and nepotism that he mentions is that it's just a corporate environment where we have to be politically correct. I don't even care about dating a co-worker. Just pass it by, go to work and date outside of your environment, learn game, go out there and meet other people. Some males might not have that. They try to do more of a social group 
gathering in. If there's only a few pretty girls at work, you have to think outside the box. There's not just those girls you see at work. There's plenty of other females to date. And with the HR department being in full control with the government, this is a no-no. Also, he points out the booth babe, which is a term for someone trying to sell products by using a hot female, whether a young, hot, attractive female, whether it be a bikini or just extremely beautiful female that will attract attention. Sex sells. And with desperate males looking to meet women, some of these males can do desperate things just to get a female. They may compete or or they might be too thirsty. Reset number 11, in all things have no preferences. This is another term for being content. For the monk is being content with all things, being appreciative, and understanding that the world is not all about you. For the warrior, he is saying, the opposite of not having a preference is to have a preference and to have something to stand for, to have a weapon of choice. Prefer the best. You want to have as clear as mine as possible, so prefer it. And for the teacher, I agree with the teacher the most, is that you might have a preference of something, but you have to be okay to not to work around that. It's Don't be fixed on just one way. You are surrounded with people and you have to cooperate with their preference as well and it can be a weakness because everything has to be tailored to you you're not considering your environment around you you're focused on the wrong thing the natural way is it it is what it is it is the real world versus the fantasy and anything that causes these little stresses in you is going to create a distraction and what you don't want is a distraction you want to focus on the present moment for the insurance executive this is my second favorite quote in the book I prefer not to go skydiving after Edward Scissorhands has packed the parachute. So she's saying, you know, it really depends on what it is the preference is for. It depends on the situation. She is obviously going to choose the safe route. Make sure you understand the yin and yang concept of harmony and evil. You'll understand the safety uh, of female desires. For the businessman, in terms of preferences, is that you are unable to do it all. So there is really no preference. You have to stay innovative and keen to the market. You will have uh, core competencies. The only preference is really to run the business and get shit done. But the preference is to sell a distinct product for a customer. So you have to understand that the customer has a preference. So you're not going to sell anything unless you satisfy the customer's quench. Reset number 12, be indifferent to where you live. This one I think is one of the more important ones where it is imperative to be able to be always on your toes, to be able to move around and to be in the zone. You may like one place or don't like another, but you have to not care. Especially when you travel, especially in the United States, there's, uh, this doesn't include everybody, but there is this comfort. The United States is, it's very comforting. I think people have gotten soft. It's good to have a little ruggedness, a little adventure. It builds character. And you could go to the gym and, you know, work out. But I think the true adventure is going outdoors. And they have this workout in the gym called the Man Makers. And it's where you do a push-up and you do like a incline pull-up, like a little lift with both your arms. And then you do a burpee and then do a press the weights on top of you. And those are called Man Makers. But that isn't a Man Maker. You're in the gym and that's just weights. It is utterly useless other than the physical look of it and that's the type of males that you're seeing is they're becoming just about looks not muscle and if you go outdoors you're going to have a little more grit hence it builds character it's not just protein shakes and steroids and for the monk he is saying you should be heading toward vital resources which is of course correct but there's always this hunt there's a hunter and gather instinct inside you that is natural and it should be used and propelled This part of the monk I was kind of disappointed in. I thought he would talk more about being in the zone, being comfortable with your environment and being aware of it. But he goes on into a needing vital resources in terms of sanitation and resources. And he says that movings is a disturbance, but I think if you're a monk, you're content with being in the zone, being comfortable with your environment, wherever you be, whether you be in New York City or The Sahara's in Africa. The old time quote, wherever you go, there you are. 
for the warrior, his prime concern is safety. And this safety is more of a, maybe a, a genetic drive that the warrior has to provide and protect. But I think in terms of mental fortitude and toughness, that the warrior in this sense is wrong. He should be able to be content wherever he is. Otherwise, he's just a, a weak-willed hipster from the city. For the teacher, it's more about age and lifestyle that you want to live. It really depends on what you, not so much what you need, but what your situation is. For the insurance executive, of course, she wants somewhere safe and non-threatening to herself and her family. And with violence coming down, this is a good thing. And there has been a rise in gun shootings. And this I see as an issue in terms of always want a safe environment. You have these safe spaces that people are requiring in this world. And that's just not going to happen. I lived in a gated community out in Southern California once, and it, it's not real. There's, you know, there's the real rich areas and there's the poor areas, which is okay. But everything is holistic connected. This is what the Eastern philosophy teaches. Everything is not linear and rigid. Everything is connected. You are not immune to your neighbor's problems. And the businessman is really just talking about how areas are different, how prices can change. He talks about Silicon Valley and the San Francisco Bay Area where I live and how that's very high price and it is high priced. If you go to other places around the country, they're much cheaper and you can get more. Right now, there's just a huge boom in the tech industry that it's pushing out the locals and it's even the san francisco it's pushing out the gay people the techies are taking and it is kind of getting boring out there in san francisco area it's getting two two-way hipsters so i like to go out and go to the mountains and go be around real people family-oriented environment but ultimately i think this is the worst chapter that they wrote about i added my own that you have to be indifferent to where you live you have to be content with the situation i travel a lot i'm not sure about the other five people in this is that you do learn a ton as a man being out on your own traveling. There is nothing to cater to your needs. You have to take and accept whatever environment you have. Everything's fresh and new, and it's something you have to accept. And as a man, you better be prepared for everything. There is no one to help you, and when something is missing or lacking or you need help, you get a good response in yourself and your own body that you have to work to understand the present moment to make things work out. Precept number 13, do not pursue the taste of good food. And they start off with a pretty good quote. You don't have to cook fancy or complicated masterpieces, just good food from fresh ingredients. Julia Child. For the monk, if you're in a state of hunger, there will be a new appreciation for food. When you're lacking, you're going to make up for it. And that type of drive, whether it be sexual or hunger, creates an energetic feel. Be content. For the warrior, obviously he wants to be in his tip-top shape. He thinks that, you know, this is obvious that you should not be pursuing junk food. You should be pursuing foods that are actually helpful for you. Like what Bruce Lee said, where he, he only desired foods that were essentially going to produce something inside you. No waste. No empty calories. For the teacher, I wholeheartedly agree with this person. I, I don't like eating kale. I mentioned this in my other video that I were producing with uh, Mike Cernovich's juice power is that putting kale and stuff, kale is nasty. I don't know why put, people eat it, but it is okay in little quantities mixed with other things to dilute the taste. But I'd rather eat spinach or broccoli. And to never overindulge when you go to Vegas, there's tons of buffets. And if you go through that, I want to eat as much as I can. Our bodies are made to, to get as much as possible. If food's available, we're going to eat it. Uh, to be content is more important. There's nothing wrong with eating vegetables. Uh, I would consider it the best way to lose weight. For the insurance executive, she says everything in moderation. And you see everybody obsessed with diets. And what they do is they will pick a particular diet and then they have like their cheat food. The cheat food is, is like the temptation. It is good just eat all around healthy. Not many people can live with that diet. I eat almonds and yogurt. I eat very bland and boring stuff. And when you get rid of all this fast food and not so much seasoning, but salt and all these other ingredients like corn syrup that they add to products, the flavors and brightness of certain foods, natural foods, will, will taste good. And it's important to appreciate your food. And for the businessman, he pretty much says gluttony is clearly unhealthy. And he disagrees with that you shouldn't pursue good food. 
just don't overdo it. In my opinion, you shouldn't be pursuing the taste of good food, but pursuing food in general. I think hunting and growing your own vegetables are really important. I grow my own pepper tree, but there's a newfound appreciation for things that you cook, you plant, or you hunt, or fish. There's a con deep connection there that many people don't understand. It's connection with nature. Many of the stuff that products you order, especially out here in the United States, they have antibiotics that protect animals to make them bigger. They plump them up. Like chickens aren't chicken. They're Barry Bonds chickens and blackberries that I buy from Costco. Sometimes they look natural, but sometimes they look like Barry Bonds blackberries. So especially there's a mentality of more the better. And some of this food does go to waste. And I don't like to waste. I like to appreciate everything around me. But the time consumed for pursuing good food is not worth it. If you are waiting in line for an hour just to eat at the Cheesecake Factory, there's plenty of better things you could do. And especially if you live in San Francisco where they have Restaurant Central, you have all these yuppie hipsters out there. They, they don't really do anything but work and eat, eat at restaurants. And in terms of a city girl, I, I would never look at a San Francisco girl and want to date her. Uh, she couldn't cook anything. The only kitchen she I would probably find her is a California pizza kitchen. And in terms of liquor, too, as well, uh, people can pursue alcohol, you know, as a night out, drinking beers. Is that you don't want to satisfy your thirst that way. Is you're dependent on alcohol to have a good time, to have liquid courage to, say, approach a girl, to have liquid courage to approach a, a single female at the bar. You just go ahead and cold approach anywhere. And I think in terms of the good food, I think the good conversation during the meal is the height of the meal, the sharing of the gift, and also to have standards, to not demote yourself to be a person of beta male thirst. I have zero tolerance for beta male thirst. And in terms of high-end foods, there's not, there's not much that high-end foods can give you. Like the, There's, of course, that mystical thing of shark fin soup, that there's mystical powers that... that they can give you like a whales or paying a top tier wine. You could get a good wine for ten dollars. And it's important to eat wild foods like wild salmon, not just the farm salmon. Is that the foods nowadays it's the animals too is becoming domesticated. And what happens is people are getting domesticated themselves. There's no wild spirit. So go outside and get wild. Reset number 14, do not hold on to possessions you no longer need. This reminds me of that Fight Club, I don't know the exact quote. The possessions you own finally end up owning you. And what you do is you sacrifice your freedom. And nothing is important as freedom. For the monk, he says, let go of items of the past. And that could be, say, photos that you have of a, on your Facebook of a past relationship that you know you still don't want to let go. It could be get rid of the friend on the electronic program or not. Everything is really connected, so it doesn't really matter, but you have to let go of the past, live in the present. For the warrior, it is important to get rid of junk and clutter. Pay attention to what's really important. For the teacher, he had won a trophy for some event. It had been damaged. He got upset about it. It's just a trophy. It's just an item. It doesn't matter. There's no reason to get upset over a little scratch. There's nothing going to clean up that act. It happened. And if you have too many possessions, that means you have to have a bigger place to store them. You can't be a hoarder. Be free and be living in the now. And when you have all this stuff, this junk, it's just going to crowd your mind of where it is and you have to take care of it. For the insurance executive, she has the right mentality of always needing to acquire a possession. This is a huge issue in the West is people get a sense of accomplishment by buying things. You could see that, especially in guys, they, they might buy a really nice car, nice big truck, but sometimes that could be making up for shortcomings, insecurity. And by working to buy something, you're going to get this empty soul, just a material item. And you may show it off and you'll see some guys do this. They think that buying a car will get them a girl. And it can work, but just a cheap and shallow way to get a girl, most of the time it doesn't work because that's, that's not how the universe works. That's not game. And instead of buying material items, what you could do is invest in yourself. That's the best investment. As well as sharing gifts with other people. As you notice that I mentioned in my other videos, I always mentioned that the tribal gift is giving the tribe a gift. It's not so much better than money, but it's because money is a social construct. It's a story. 
that people buy into. A tribal gift is a, an internal impression. So you can declutter and if it is digital, use Evernote and buy my Evernote books. And for the businessman, it's important to get rid of past clunky items that no longer work or are outdated. Have a philosophy of continuous innovation and new products are always online. But be content. Don't chase the new item. And to follow up this precept, I would make sure to watch the movie Fight Club or read the book. Precept number 15, do not act following customary beliefs. For the monk, he talks about the Musashi and how Musashi was a very unique individual. He was very weird and had his own style. Most of the other samurais were using the one sword technique and what Musashi had was two swords. And, and if you read the Book of Rings, he has two sword style, a long sword and a short sword. He went his own way and created this two sword style. People didn't like it, but he didn't follow. He wasn't a follower. And just like you see in my other video with the, the monkey chant at Burning Man, is that people, there's these mirror neurons in people that people are followers, especially women. And it is okay to be different, to be unique. And when they say you're not a unique, beautiful snowflake, they're really putting you down. But you are a unique person. Everybody is. Maybe zombies, you don't want to take the safe route or the comfortable route. Those are all boring. He calls it the mean and the mean is conventional. And in terms of these beliefs, you don't have to abide by these beliefs because beliefs are in constant friction with creativity. Creativity is the natural. The teacher uses the story of Crazy Horse and how his tribe out in South Dakota had to innovate General Custard and their fighting techniques were killing them. What Crazy Horse did is he used people as bait, created new strategies to win because they obviously weren't winning the old way and they were creating new ways. They were using decoys to lead the white soldiers into a trap. Just uh, try something new. For the teacher, he uses the old concept of rebel without a cause. He mentions the social justice warriors. And this is a huge issue, especially where I'm at in the San Francisco Bay Area. And what social justice warriors are is it's a version of cultural Marxism to use a mob to oppress something or someone. And justice isn't a virtue, but freedom is. And there are statements on social media that are said and done, but you don't have to actually do what they say. You don't have to abide by the rules. That's the point of freedom. So I would just ignore the social justice warriors. They tend to pick on the weak. For the insurance executive, she makes it a point to be different and to have courage. Be unique and be an artist like Musashi. Musashi doesn't care about the rules of the game. He just cares about his precepts. For the businessman, he cites Amazon and Jeff Bezos' creativity and creating that business model. He just started with books and he became this massive company. Also, Thomas Edison and all his experiments doing tons of tests with failures and just being creative. And he wasn't a big fan of Kindle readers. Kindle, Amazon Kindle, I would put as my favorite app. And where you have the contrast of creativity and beliefs, you have the contrast of imagination and knowledge. Precept number 16, do not collect weapons or practice with weapons beyond what is useful. For the monk, he pretty much states that the size, which is like a a pitchfork sword, mini sword, is what Raphael uses in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And it's going away. To keep it simple, you know, just use a few weapons and master those. What can you use versus what is a decoration? And for the warrior, I like what he has. He has a ton of weapons. He's probably into having too many weapons. He has the nunchucks, throwing knives. The warrior, he's got a ton of other weapons that he just collected over the years, of course. And he's got nunchucks, throwing knives, tomahawks, katana. I have a tomahawk that I like. I have a few of them, actually. You know, though it's enjoyable and fun to use these little weapons, they're not as practical. And you don't want to be stuck with the paradox of choice. Too many choices can be bad for you. Uh, choose two or three of the top weapons. The teacher disagrees with Musashi as well. I mean, it's important not to have a wall hanger sword or to be a wallflower in life, but to be into the game, into the arena, and never use a pointless weapon. Insurance executive makes it a point to be serious with your weapons. Don't play around with it. It's not to be a joke. When there are times for crucial conversations, have a serious conversation. 
And this can be in contrast to guns because some people have, they don't just don't have one gun. It's like tattoos. Most of the time they have five or ten, uh, they have five or ten guns. And they typically want to show them off too when I'm around people. And you got to think about the storage for this and ammunition. For the businessman, he programs everything into a list of bureaucracy data, just too much data. And in terms of weapons, he sees it as the tools to run the business. So you don't want to get caught up in a tool bloat. Keep it simple and get the job done. Precept number 17, do not fear death. I think this is the most important precept because it involves courage. Just like a deer in headlights, fear can box you in. It's what separates the men and the boys. And by stepping outside and being an individual, you are at least trying to get rid of that fear of the unknown. For the monk, he puts it as the fear of the unknown. And he cites the kamikaze pilots of Japan. Of course, this was after Musashi was late 1500s to early 1600s. But the kamikaze pilots of Japan, and in terms of the World War II, they were warriors that would not accept defeat. They were fearless. For the warrior, he recommends reading the Yamamoto's Sundatomo Hagakure. I missed that up. The Hagakure is the Book of the Samurai, or the Bushido way. And in terms of living in the present, you can't look to the future and you have to accept death. It comes to us all. Be valiant. You shouldn't have the shivering legs of a chihuahua. You have to accept the reality that you're going to die. Accept the way. For the teacher, if you accept death, then you have a greater appreciation for life. And it's a reminder that you're going to die. Or having a close encounter. Or escaping a near, what you consider a near-death experience. And this is a very important thing that he says is fear is a waste of time. And it clouds your thoughts. With mastery, you want clarity. I do think hipsters need to get out of the city and experience a little more. Don't waste your life fearing death. Take a step forward and take a chance. For the insurance executive, she says, and I like this too, is to, that they used to drink sake together before a commencement, before they were going to die or before a war or a fight. And this is, brings a togetherness, a connection that I, we don't live in fear. And you can see it in everybody's face that we're going to die. We're not scared. And here's a pretty good quote. Experts on the samurai believe they intuitively knew that fear causes the brain to shut down. The result of an accelerated heartbeat, shallow breathing, tunnel vision, and exclusion of select sound. This is what life is about. Is you. This fear has to be overridden. There is this fight or flight function, especially in males, where you have to fight or you run away. But there is this zone that you can, can acquire, it takes time, where you do not fear you're in the zone and I get to this place by rock climbing, not panicking, or not breathing hard. You're in the moment. For business, it's the fear of loss that he points out, is that if you're not taking risks in business, then you're, you might stagnate and you don't want to be paralyzed by fear. And in terms of fear, some people have a hard time looking at themselves for being alone, doing things to avoid loneliness like the big city, to be in solitude, like in the title, The Way of Walking Alone, is if you could reverse it to say something to the way of walking independent. Being fearful is easy, but being courageous takes action and character. Precept number 18, do not seek to possess either goods or fiefs for your old age. And what fiefs are is a estate and land titles to, to your property. This was back in the ages of feudalism. For the monk, this is to not acquire a trophy wife. When you're an old man, don't look for the youngest wife to hang around with. And with the times come wisdom and experience, and you should be evolving from the teenage angst, the childhood, to being a fully actualized adult. Even though this might be an issue, it doesn't really matter what age some people are. They can be stuck in the, the anal phage, teenage phase, or a moment that they had in their life. They've never matured. They could be entitled or a spoiled brat, not gotten enough experiences to harden up. And what I think this means is you're a grown adult. You, you should know better. And for the warrior, he points out how health technology has advanced. There's ways to increase your age. Not so much increase your age, but to increase your lifespan. And I think this is doesn't go with how Musashi lived. I think it's better to live hard and to live courageously and to be fearless. 
And if you're that person where, especially if you're male, to be very conservative, you want to live a long life, that goes against bravery and ex real life experience. Because going outdoors and getting real life experiences invites risks. And instead of a, amassing all these material items and lands, it's better to have experiences and to have shared experiences. Even though Musashi was not that type of person to share himself with people. He did at this, his old age share these two works of wisdom, the Book of Five Rings and the Dokodo. The teacher provides a little bit of wisdom in terms of this is a new era where you want to secure your retirement. I, I believe that's a little conservative, but it's it's very easy to do as you can save your money versus living hard and reckless carefree style, saving everything for old age. Even if you die, there isn't really much loss because all those items were material items. They were of not, not much significance. And you do see this, especially with the baby boomer generation. They don't want to spend as much during life, but they do accumulate everything toward the end. It's like a, a big bang when they die. They have a, a retirement, not so much a retirement, but a, a, a trust at the end. Or that's, it's only money. That's all I'm saying. It's only money. For the insurance executive, she advises to be a seeker of happiness and, and not the short-lived moments and not live by the short burst of that moments provide of emotion but to wait till old age see your your lifespan as a, a 60 or 70 year lifespan not to be lived hardly during your 20s but the businessman he really looks into not so much providing deeds and material items for when you die or when you get old but to be a leader and to have people follow you but to really create leaders for the next generation and leading by example, creating more of a, a long-term brand. Precept number 19, respect Buddha and the gods without counting on their help. This is a statement of independence and solitude and self-reliance. I kind of equate this to Henry David Thoreau and the transcendentalist and uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. To be self-reliant, you can do it. For the monk, he wants you to invest in skills and abilities to be at your best, strive for mastery and a sense of self-reliance. You may need help, but the attitude is I could take care of myself, not to be a victim or to be in a state of learned helplessness, because that can be a pattern instead of a I can do it type of model. Don't blame your ex. Don't blame the government. Don't blame the God. Take ownership and responsibility for the warrior contrast between acting versus praying and what you want to do is act act on stuff. You don't want to pray and hope. Not to have that Obama-like hope, because uh, hope is like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's very weak. It'll come back to bite you. Waiting and blaming your hero to rescue you is not the way to live. Take action. And to have nothing to have hindrance and to be self-motivating. For the teacher, he puts it as wishing and wanting, and that's something you don't want to put yourself in. I think what you should be doing is being a hustler. I look up to the hustler. The hustler tends to have a chip on the shoulder. I'm learning from Gary Vanderchuk to have that type of hustler mentality. I've been reading a lot of hustler books. They don't, not so much they don't take no for an answer, is they have this flow and this workaround of I can do it attitude. And for the businessman, he puts it as I believe, I'm taking an interpretation of what he wrote as in business is God can be, say, the government. The government can destroy it or help it out. And you don't want it to be at the whims of a government in terms of a God. And I like this term that he used. It's a French term, force majeure. And in French, it means superior force, which really means the acts of God, as he puts it. That was my interpretation of the gods and asking for help. Precept number 20, you may abandon your own body, but you must preserve your honor. You have to live a life of character. You have to live a life admirable, never to be a true coward. And what you do in life, it accumulates. And if you're not learning from these events or omens, you're not a person of character. I think what this means is never to be a disgrace. I mean, there is no reason to be shameful or guilty. What's done is done and what's happened has happened. But you have to learn from that and not bring down the whole tribe in terms of a nihilistic fashion. The monk puts it that all privacy has been lost with the internet, and I believe that is not true, is that whatever you post on the in internet and what you show will be on full display. But we are in a time where things that are said can be used against you, especially with the digital age and with the social justice warriors happening and with freedoms 
being trampled on in a totalitarian way. Who is someone's right to say that this is wrong and you should be punished? They can create a lie just for the hell of it. I think you're just going to be up. You have to be able to withstand the lies. You could take a punch. It's not fair, but that's the way the world is. For the warrior, it is simply to live the way, to live honorable, general. And if you're not living honorable, you're a coward. And the worst thing you could be is a coward. Not so much so signs of weakness, but if you're not showing signs of growth and rituals of bravery and only you could speak for yourself there's no one else that can and you are the only one that can is in control of your honor keep your word and that is honor for the teacher it's really to have no shame and to live honorably only you can determine that especially in your old age big bold actions are remembered even if it's not remembered by the public you know your own self. And Japanese culture tends to really pride itself on this honor. For instance, in the Western countries, it's more of a guilt shaming. Not so much guilt shaming, but more of a, a guilt pressed through sins. Most of the Asian cultures, not all of them, but it's more of a shame. And this shame will be the testament that you encounter. You have to test it out and really conquer it. And in terms of the businessman, he's very honest in what he says is honor is not the most important thing in business. The trust will be there or won't be there for the brand. It's not known for its integrity, ethics, and honor. That's how he puts it. But there is a level of ethics that you go through in life. And if you read Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller, you could find out more about that on how a, a business can really eat you up and your family. There's not so much business that's important. What you've done in your life, did you live it well? And to always do your due diligence in business. I've had some bad investments tank, but more of those were risks. I was young and risk, so it came it panned out well. I had some investments come and go. Some businesses are not that ethical. There's always the voodoo accounting or the Italian banking system. Precept number twenty one, never stray from the way. The way is a way, it can't be boxed in. It's the path. The samurai path for whatever Musashi wanted to live, how he wanted to live. There's a ritual that he wanted to upheld. This type of radical, not radical, it's almost a form of rugged individualism, self-reliance. This is more of a masculine trait. I don't, I would be very curious to see how he lived. To stay on that direct path, you know, there could be a fork in the road where there's temptation or another path or an easy way out. There's, I told you before, there's an easy way to complain. There's an easy way to be a victim, to be entitled have resentment. All those things are easy and to stay the path to be to have a hyper focus of the way you want to go and the person you want to be, that is like a laser vision. Almost like a Martin Luther King type vision or a Steve Jobs type of vision. To be unwavering and to be direct like a gun. For the monk, the way is a it's a rhymer and a ritual. And when this you consider these rhyme rituals, he's talking about a baby, how they the child's love the pattern. And it's like a vibration. It's like think of people as vibrations or connections, not so much what they look like, but in an invisible way, a darkness that people have an energy, a vibration that you could connect with. If you if you are willing to connect with people and they operate at frequencies, kinda like sonar. They can be felt like a, an earthquake, a spiritual enlightenment that reaches you. It cannot be felt other than the person that you are. And it's not going to be a straight and easy path because that's the path of least resistance. The path of the way is going to be more of a curvy grind, a hustle route. You may have to veer off course. If you ever you know, make a mistake or you get involved in drugs, sex, alcohol, issues, prison, if you make a mistake, you know, that's very forgiving. But the one thing you do is you get back, get back on the horse and you ride. And you ride with the rough riders. And for the warrior, it's the mastery is the path. And all these accumulation of all these experiences and what you've learned, the mistakes, the training, the mentorship, that this is a pathway toward mastery. And I think Musashi's mentioned in Robert Greene's Mastery book, but I know he's mentioned in The 33 Strategies of War, which is my favorite book that Robert Greene wrote. And all this wisdom that you've mastered, all your techniques and skills, they will come to the surface no matter what. You can't keep it to yourself. The way of the universe and the gods and spirits, it comes out. And for Musashi, it came out, both those, both these books came out in his last year or two of life. For the teacher, I learned that 
Kung Fu means hard work. Also, that potential is untapped and that people are untapped energy. They're not aware of themselves, especially now. They're, they are zombies. They're walking zombies eating their fast food, their McDonald's burgers, and their social media with their staring at their cell phone all day. Is that there's limitless potential inside you. And with these rituals, experiences, the more you read, the more you experience, that the people that live hard or live life, they're going to be the ones that reach potential. And then once they reach potential, it's the job. Not so much a job, but people around them have to recognize this to bring them, bring them to a, a point of mastery so that they can lead more. You're leading future leaders and not feeding entitled weaklings. For the businessman, it's the way of tactics and the tactics that he's learned from business from being, I don't know, an entrepreneur or just starting as an intern, but building all these business routines and execution and he makes it a point to work hard and train and keep on training to your master there is a threshold i believe uh, they call it like the ten thousand hours i don't really abide by that i think it's actually faster than that if you're very passionate and you you're in the zone you just love it you just keep on doing it and you just don't stop you get into that present moment just keep learning and going for it to close things off, I wanted to remind you to read Musashi's other book, The Book of Five Rings. As I mentioned before, that is one of my favorite books that I read last year. And the, the original Dokodo was these 21 precepts, and there is still they still have the original document out there in Japan. And I'm very glad that he shared his wisdom in these books, as well as the other five people in this book that shared all their total wisdom about what they thought about his precepts. And understand that there are translation issues, as I mentioned before, that you could see this as the way of walking alone, but I do see it as the way of self-reliance. And make sure you check out Ralph Waldo Emerson and his book, Self-Reliance. And here's a real quick end of review that I wanted to mention is to be independent. And it is okay to take charge. You don't necessarily have to look for mentors. He is, Musashi is considered a ronin, a masterless samurai. Take steps and increase your skills to get to mastery. Be fearless, be courageous, and it is okay to be weird and unique. Dance to the beat of your own drum. Be at the present moment. Ignore your haters and followers. Travel and go into darkness. Go for it, don't be a wimp. Never be a victim. It is easy to complain and feel resentment, to be entitled, yell or scream or be jealous. And those are all excuses to not work on your insecurities. Take care of yourself and never veer from the way. Read the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu and The Art of War by Sun Tzu. I did a review of Tao Te Ching too. You could look at that video as well. Be content and never be lacking. Never be jealous. And when you read all these these Eastern philosophy books, you have to remember that it's not logical and rigid. It's not a binary system. It's not a, a Western philosophy of just knowledge. It's deep wisdom for Eastern philosophy. And the process is in between the lines. And being obscured in darkness, that's where the way presents itself. And in order to stay calm under pressure, you have to be present in the moment, not in the past and not in the future. There are times in your life where you may be surrounded by sheep or zombies, yet you must always sense in every situation what Musashi would do. That is the way.